here he is, the man of the hour. And can I'm you sure hear? You can, absolutely can hear you, and I'm sure you can hear me. <laughs> now that I remember this, uh, you're right. We we did it through my phone. Like, what the heck is going on? Oh, man. <laughs> One of those things. But great to see you, mate. Hey, good to see you, Drew. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yes, it was one of those very scary things, but one of those things that I recovered very fast, which was weird. Yeah. And what bad timing that was. Yeah, I was in Hong Kong, mate, and uh, the flight to US was the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was pretty scary, mate, but uh, fortunately, everything's fine. And Quite honestly, I had so many things on my plate. I don't know how I was going to deal with travel to the US and everything I was going on. So kind of a blessing in disguise. The only bad part of it was is I missed the conference, which was the thing I've been looking for for four years, not one year. <laughs> I know. Oh, that's true. It's been, God, it's almost been, geez, half a decade. Holy, holy smokes. That's crazy, man. It's crazy, man. So I'll have to make up for it. Uh, I'll be in the US sometime this year for sure to make okay. up for me because I was coming to the ISSM conference, but um, also I had like six, eight other meetings in other in other cities. I was uh, the conference was at the end, and I had about ten days of other meetings prior, or well, not ten days, seven days of other meetings prior. So yeah, but I'll be definitely there next year, mate. Absolutely cannot wait. So I'll yeah. be double drinking protein next time. <laughs> Yeah, definitely make your way to South Florida because there's, there's a lot going on down here. So uh, um, I see there's a few people on here with us already. Uh, Andreas, yep. I don't know if I've met on. Hi, Dr. Hi. Antonio. Greetings from Cyprus. Oh, from Cyprus. Wow. Other side of the world. Yeah, we've got a bit of everybody on this um, this cohort. So this is a new, um, just to introduce uh, Dr. Jose. This is a new uh, p and &E Level 2 slash CISSN uh, cohort. Um, so this cohort, uh, those that have joined us live, some people busy and, uh, you know, but um, we've got Andreas from Cyprus. We've got Christine from the Philippines, your fellow country lady. Um, hey, I'll, I'll be in the Philippines next summer, actually, bringing my wife and two daughters. So... Uh... They've never been there. I've actually only, oh. <laughs> I've only been there once, to be honest. I was there in 1998. So, oh, oh. yes, a lot has changed here. So, yeah, Barakay, go to Barakay, Bohol. <laughs> so, it'll be a fun little Best trip. Summers. Yeah. That's awesome, mate. You'll have to uh, um, come and come to Japan and uh, Shanghai if you have the time, mate. But you're probably busy, and I know you love travel, Dr. Jose. <laughs> Yeah, my once a year travel. Then after that, I'm happy to sit in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a lovely backyard at that. So we've got also Alan Choi from Malaysia. And who else have yep. we got on here today? Um, a few others. I'm trying to get the... So Andreas, Christine... Alst Alston also from Malaysia, and Alston's just got a promotion working with the Olympic Committee, actually, oh, cool. um, in nutrition and uh, and a lot of other things. But I'll let them introduce themselves a little later. Um, I'd like to firstly welcome you, Dr. Jose. I'm glad we got the technical, and uh, thank thank the Lord for all of these amazing devices. And we've always got a plan B. Absolutely, yeah. We just got to remember this is the plan A next time. And just <laughs> just go straight to the phone. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good quality anyway. In fact, the lens on these phones are, are better for video than even the computer these days as well. Wow. Yeah, I'm actually any. I've got my camera is my iPhone. It's a way to way to do it on cool. the computer. Cool. Anyway, cool. I just just wanted to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jose. For those that don't uh, know, Dr. Jose Antonio, the CEO and co-founder of the ISSN. Um, if you don't know, well, um, you shouldn't be on this and we'll, we'll kick you off because you absolutely should know, um, being, being the co-founder and um, the, the creator, uh, the co-creator of uh, the, the uh, illustrious, uh, very famous and 
considered by many um, the the best uh, sports nutrition certification uh, in the world in sports nutrition, the CISSN or the Certified Sports Nutritionist, which you have all um, applied for. And uh, about three quarters of the way through, I believe, at least on the live um, components, some of you may have already finished the um, the uh, recorded versions, um, the the playback professional videos, um, but these live reviews and the guest lecturers, um, I believe we're about three quarters of the way through. So I won't talk too much um, other than the, the fact that um, apart from founding the ISSN, which Dr. Jose will give you a story about that and a Japanese restaurant. And if you haven't heard the story, um, it's, it's an amazing story, but there's a lot more to that um, story as well. Um, the other components is Dr. Jose is a researcher and done a lot of research in all areas of sports nutrition. If there's, there's a subject of sports nutrition that Jose, Dr. Jose doesn't know, I'd be surprised, but predominantly protein, I would consider Dr. Jose to be one of the world's most um, experts on protein consumption, specifically for athletes, um, more than the general population, um, but there is some crossover there for the general population too, and no protein does not kill you or give you kidney damage or make you bald, you're only predisposed to baldness like Dr. Jose and Antonio and I, no, that's creatine, right, um, just joking. <laughs> Um, so also creatine and a plethora of other things. And um, in summary of why the International Society of Sports Nutrition was founded, um, which I've been now in the sports nutrition industry for two and a half decades. So uh, five years um, prior to the ISSN being founded. And when I was working for General Nutrition Centre, GNC in Australia and, and many other sports nutrition companies, there was a big gap between science and marketing, a massive gap. And with that, it was very difficult for the consumers and industry to really determine what actually worked, um, you know, what was bro science and what was marketing and what was completely BS. So um, Dr. Jose Antonio and a group of passionate uh, researchers, PhDs um, in this field, including um, his his good friend, my good friend and co-founder, Doug, Dr. Douglas Kalman, and a few others uh, formed the ISSN to really um, cut out the bullshit when it comes to sports nutrition and really prove what is science-backed. And with that, apart from them founding it, but then they put together the uh, position stands, which are a collection or a summary of all of the research out there to really, rather than you guys having to shift through thousands of papers and, and through the, the good and bad ones, there's a good summary. So the position stands, if you haven't read all the position stands, no, you will not be passing the CISSN exam. Um, but then also there's the JISSN, the Journal of the ISSN, which has thousands of research um, uh, journals um, in there as well. And there's a lot of other things, including the networking, which I sadly missed the the 20th anniversary of the, the ISSN, and that's every year. And uh, later we'll talk about the upcoming webinar um, for, for the ISSN that is available. And if with you guys being a member of GPNI, you'll get a small discount if you would like to attend the live. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Jose Antonio. Thank you, Drew. Actually, that was a, a very uh, beautiful introduction. I mean, you really encapsulated, you know, why, you know, the ISSN was started and things like that. I do want to give uh, your audience a brief um, sort of background of who I am, where I've come from, why we formed the ISSN. Um, I was actually born in uh, Quezon City, uh, Philippines, um, many, many years ago. So. But my parents emigrated to the United States when I was quite young, so I actually grew up in the United States. Um, and my father, <clears throat> my father was a physician, and his dream was to have a private practice in Washington D.C. He realized his dream, and you know, sort of semi-following in his footsteps, uh, rather than going into medicine, since it seems like every Filipino immigrant either goes into medicine or nursing. I thought, you know what, I'm going to go into science because apparently no one wants to go into science, and as an undergrad and then grad student, my interest had always been in sports nutrition. Now, here's what's interesting. Before the year 2000 in the United States and probably all over the world, 
there really wasn't sports nutrition science per se. In fact, most people treated sports nutrition and sports supplements kind of as uh, sort of the black sheep of the academic family. It's like it didn't really get any respect. And a lot of the major organizations like the American College of Sports Medicine, which is probably the largest sports medicine group in the world, they didn't think, you know, studying sports nutrition or sports supplements made any sense. They, you know, they didn't think it was a legitimate field of inquiry. So that's really what prompted myself. And you mentioned Dr. Doug Kelman, one of my close friends. He actually lives about 30, 40 minutes south of me. And a few other scientists, you know, Rick Kreider. Um, we met, actually, it's funny, he said, at a Japanese restaurant. We did. We met at a Japanese restaurant in San Francisco. This was 21 years ago. And we decided to start our own organization, which focused on sports nutrition and sports supplements. We came up with the name International Society of Sports Nutrition. And the goal was to inculcate more science into the industry. And, and Drew, as you know, if you go back 20 or 30 years in sports in the industry, people were making all sorts of weird claims about all their products with, with, with no science. And I think just in the last 20 years alone, we've made so much progress in terms of the amount of science that you find in, in sports nutrition products in general. It's, it's been actually a huge, huge um, sort of increase in the amount of science there is. Now, you had alluded to the position papers. What's great about the ISSN is we put together probably, I've lost count, it's somewhere between 12 and 20 position stands, which summarize the literature, depending on what, what uh, topic you're looking for. We've done it on protein, on creatine, on caffeine, on energy drinks. We have actually one on coffee that's coming out soon. We we just uh, published one on female athletes that Stacy Sims, uh, Stacy Sims was the lead author of. So for people who don't have time, which is almost everyone, who don't have time to read all of the literature, I mean, let the scientists do that. That's why the position stands are so important because it summarizes so much of the information that otherwise you could either read our position stand or you could read the 50 to 100 articles, peer reviewed articles that are published. And, I mean, unless you're a professional scientist, no one has time for that. I mean, even scientists oftentimes don't have time for that because like, there's just too much to read. So our goal with the ISSN is, is to promote the science of sports nutrition and supplements. The challenge all of you have, and Drew, you're well aware of this, is that because of social media, there is so much information that you're being bombarded with. And it's, it's like, how do you sift through all the information? Well, the way you sift through it is like uh, with GP&I, with ISSN, you focus on those areas, those, those individuals that can provide scientifically based information. Otherwise, otherwise you're just going to believe anything that anyone says on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. So, so that's really the gist of it. I mean, our goal, we want to promote science. And I always say, if you know the science, then being a practitioner makes it that much easier because now you understand why you're doing something versus, let's face it, there's a lot of personal trainers in the United States who, who give programs whether it's nutrition or training, and you ask, well, why do you do this? Well, I do it because it seems to work. And they don't know the why. And that's why it is important for all of you that if you know the why, that's critically important. Because if you don't know the why, then you're just repeating what other people are telling you to do without knowing whether what you're doing actually makes sense. And that's my story, Drew. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a wonderful story. Um, <laughs> and 20 years ago, I mean... Boy, oh boy, I, I remember 22, 23 years ago, you probably remember liquid creatine. Oh. I think it was American muscle or something. Was it American muscle? Uh, you're close. Muscle Marketing USA. Muscle Mark, Marketing Mark, I remember that, man. And they had like three page ads in muscle and fitness. And it's the best creatine out there. And absolute, not only it didn't work like they said, it actually was um, a creatine because it, it would oxidize in the water. So it actually was harmful and opposite to creatine. But they marketed it to be better than normal creatine. What, what, what's so, you know, it's, it's funny you brought that up. I completely forgot about that total fraud that they were selling. Oh, and dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> what's funny is it was um, they would appear at all these, com uh, all these trade shows in the U.S., Arnold, Olympia. They'd have mm. a gigantic booth because people were actually buying this stuff. Because it was very expensive, massive profit margin. Yes, yes. And, and the packaging was very pretty. I will admit, yep. I was like, really pretty bottles you got here. 
It was actually Dr. Rick Kreider who did the initial study, and he's like, there's no creatine in this. <laughs> <laughs> they got so mad. They're like, oh, yeah, there's creatine. And Rick Kreider's like, no, there's literally no creatine in this. So as quickly as they rose, they just collapsed because everyone figured out, okay, you guys are just a fraud. You're just a bunch of frauds. So, yeah. so that's a perfect example, actually. Exactly, man. But they would have made a truckload of money in that 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 interim, um, I would imagine. You know, like a lot of the other, you know, sad stories like uh, USP Labs and you know all of these other fraudulent, dangerous companies. And I think that's what's you know beyond the science and really proving what's right. But I think you've you've also been a guardian of the industry to help really separate you know people guardian in 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 exposing what you know doesn't doesn't work but also protecting people's health because you know there's just been so much rubbish and there still is you know there is still a lot of cleanup to go but compared to where it was when i started my career in the industry 25 years ago I mean, oh, there's a lot more products, a lot more brands, but yeah. but it's it's certainly cleaned up a lot. Yeah, and I think also a, a good thing, if you know where to find information, you can look up a product. So someone puts up a product mm. and they're promoting it on Instagram or Twitter. It's easy enough to find whether there is valid scientific information to support that product. I mean, because yes. the beauty of social media is now companies can't hide. I mean, back yes. when... Muscle Marketing USA came out, they could just kind of hide because it's like, who are these guys? And what are these claims they're making? But now you can't hide at all. People will find yeah. you and they will, they will, uh, you know, rightly attack you on social media. It's like, wait a minute, this is just a total fraud. What are you guys even talking about? Now, Correct. there's a flip side to that. There are many people who will believe anything. Correct. <laughs> so, Correct. I don't Correct. know what to do about those people. Correct. And case in point, the last three and a half years, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> very, very good, mate. I remember the uh, the muscle tech marketing and they would take out like five ads and, you know, 5,000% muscle increase. I mean, these ridiculous statements. Do you remember those for hydroxycut or nitro tech or cell tech? Oh, yeah. And you know what's funny? Um, well, that you could actually use those examples of the last three years as well. But let me give you a real example of an ad um, <laughs> where, where the they compared the product to the so-called placebo. And the yeah. product, they gained, they gained one pound. The placebo gained half a pound. So they would say it is 100 percent more effective because it was, <laughs> like, yeah, one pound is, yeah, versus half a pound or, or whatever. One kilo, half a kilo. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> technically, here's the funny part. It, when you ask their lawyers, technically, they're not lying. They're like, well, technically, Correct. it is 100 percent greater. But, Correct. But it's like, what, I call it a factual lie. It's like, yeah, it's true, but you're really kind of lying. <laughs> Correct, man. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a fickled and funny industry, man. And I see a lot of it. Um, you know, as you know, I I've we've we've founded it or started now. It's not so new a new company in in innovative uh, plant protein and sustainable protein. And um, I just the more and more I dig in this industry on these plant based milks and other plant based protein or plant based meat, I am. I'm just horrified. I'm extremely motivated to do a legitimate version, actually a version that is healthy, that, you know, is not uh, full of seed oil and, and uh, you know, bad protein or no protein for in, in some cases. But I'm horrified and, and, and more horrifying than just really bad products on the industry that how many people believe that they're actually good for them? Yeah, that, you know, that's absolutely true. And I think... Um... We need more people like you and people in the ISSN to be able to sift through a lot of the bullshit that you see out there um, because it's it's almost like um, the average consumer. And I get this question a lot from my students. It's like, mm -hmm. unless you know the science, how are you supposed to figure this out? Because you are bombarded with so much information and it's like, Correct. what's true? Is this not true? Oh, but this PhD said this, so it must be true. Well, not really. I mean, I don't care if they have a PhD or MD or whatever degree it it doesn't matter but at least as a consumer you can look this stuff up i mean Correct. But, but the problem is a lot of people they're kind of lazy they're like yeah i don't want to check i mean if this guy with a phd is telling me it works then it must work and it's like well 
no, not really. <laughs> not really. Well, I, I think it's a magic of marketing and hip, hypnotism in, in a lot of ways. You know, if they have a, a very good, um, you know, community following, um, they kind of hypnotize the audience. And, you know, with that hypnotism, it's, it's magic. It's great branding and great marketing, you know, case in point. I'm not going to say names. Oatly, uh, oops, I didn't say that, you know, I mean, they, they hypnotize the public, you know, cows are evil, you know, the anti-cow movement, the, the, the no cow generation, you know, all of these different things. And people, you know, excuse the pun, like a herd of, of cattle, you know, they follow this, but they don't even bother to look at is it, is it nutrition? Is it healthy? Is it good for my children? These people are, they're feeding them, their, their children, these so-called healthy milks that are very unhealthy yeah you know what's interesting is um you know in terms of people on social media and, and experts i've always wondered if if consumers didn't know how many followers someone had so and, mm. and i think that convinces a lot of people oh this person has a hundred thousand followers this person mm. has five if they didn't know how many followers they had would they be less apt to believe what they say because i think People get sort of sucked into, oh, my God, it, it, and, you know, the sheep mentality. It's like if 100 people are following you, that means it must be right. You know, well, this person has a million people. Oh, well, they must be. So I think that that sort of weird mentality convinces so many that it's like, well, if all these people seem to like them. Well, then, you know, it must be perfect. I mean, must be it must be correct. And and that's what's so maddening about social media is that oftentimes correct. the person with followers that seems to be the one that's most believed versus the ones who are actually most believable. They're too busy doing work and research that they can't really spend time on social media amassing Correct. tens of thousands of followers. It's crazy. Correct. Correct. You've made that point to me so many times when I've I've reached out to you and saying, you know, do you know someone we can work with that, you know, A, has a great social media following and B, is really good at science? And I go, and you've told me a thousand times. <laughs> Drew, they don't exist. The true <laughs> researchers are the guys doing the research, not the influence. I mean, there are a few exceptions, like Bill Campbell, um, incredible. Um, you know, and Lane Norton, although can be a little bit controversial, but controversial, but I think largely he's pretty scientific. Um, but apart from those two, I can't think of too many others that have yeah. both. Yeah, it's very hard. I mean, as you know, it's almost a semi-full-time job to get a mass of followers on social media for you because you literally have to work that every day, every day, every day. Um, Correct. And for full-time researchers, it's it's almost impossible. So amongst the people who do full-time research, it's the way to reach an audience is really each of us has to do a little bit. And collectively, if each of us does a little bit, hopefully that message gets out, you know, versus the one person who might be able to get it out to millions of people. But the problem is those people other than the few exceptions you mentioned, tend to be just people who just live on social media. And living on social media ain't the real world. It's no, <laughs> no, it's absolutely not. But thankfully, um, I, I believe, at least my own personal belief system, there is a an awakening of humanity that is, is, is in its slow, it's very minute, but there is an awakening humanity that is really trying to delve into the truth and not always believing social media or even mass media to some degree and, and really trying to pull apart, you know, not just trust the science, but actually understand and comprehend the science is maybe a, a, a better a better terminology than trust the science blindly. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely true. It's, I mean, that's what I try to inculcate into my students. I want to, you know, mm. teach don't treat, and here's a weird part, and you and I have talked about this. A lot of people treat science as a religion. Mm, correct. <laughs> it's like, wait, which religion do you want to choose today? Well, I'm going to choose this religion because he's the science. And it's like, no, you can't do that because one of the hallmarks of science is that, in a, in a way, you trust nothing. I mean, mm. scientists by their nature should not trust, should inherently not trust things, should inherently be skeptical. And by mm -hmm. being skeptical, eventually you get to, you know, I hate to use the word truth, but, you know, maybe the truth of the time, the best information at the time. At so, the time, correct. Yeah, you, you know, it, it sounds weird when students are like, oh, so I shouldn't trust you. I'm like, yeah, you don't trust me. <laughs> don't, I say, don't believe me because I'm telling you this. Believe me because I'm right and believe me because the data shows that I'm right. But 
just because I tell you this stuff in class doesn't mean it's correct. Challenge me. And I, and I say, challenge all your professors. Just because they're telling you in class doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, I, mean, I swear to God, it's true. <laughs> Absolutely. I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast in the gym earlier. Um, and, and our banter is wonderful, but we'll, we'll shortly uh, wind this up and allow the students to, to banter with you. Um, but I was listening to this Joe Rogan podcast and uh, it was uh, – I can't remember the gentleman's name, but basically he was talking about the universe and the existence of the universe. And, um, you know, he's he concluded and Joe Rogan kept challenging him and it said, you know, well, on, on the on the, the data we have at the moment, this is what we're concluding. It doesn't necessarily mean that that is the conclusive answer, but what we have from the data. I think that was a pretty valid response and a and a good response to, to validate science to what it should be and not what some scientists do. And, and I think you're right in, in saying that some some people treat it as a religion, you know, tr uh, uh, blind faith, you know, just trust on, on, on you know, because they say it's true. And I don't think that's a responsible attitude. And I don't think that's what fundamentally science is and should be. Yeah, trusting the science is the, an, is the antithesis of science Correct. And, and you know a, a lot of people who are outside of the work of, of the scientific any of the scientific fields you know when we tell them the so-called truths that we have are we call them provisional truths they're true mm. today based on the data we have today but as data accumulates or changes Correct. it's like we you have to change what you believe i mean but here's the funny part in our field you and i know that there's plenty of data that shows that high protein diets do not harm your kidneys. We know that. Absolutely. However, why do people who are otherwise educated still say harms your pro, uh, harms your kidneys? I mean, there are people at my university, professors, who still say that. Not not in my department, obviously, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in other departments. So, what is it about something like protein and kidneys that apparently there are people who treat Protein harms your kidneys almost as part of a re religious edict. It's like, well, it's true because I heard it in class. And then they repeat it to their students. They repeat it to their students mm -hmm. when, in fact, wait a minute. That's not what the data says. So there okay. is a disconnect even amongst people who are, quote, experts in their respective fields. And mm -hmm. people ask me, well, why does this happen? And to be honest, I've thought about this for a long time. And it's like, I don't know. Either people are lazy or they're just not very smart. I don't know what it is. It's crazy. I think it's, you know, both or, or all of those things. And I think it, there was another um, Joe Rogan. I've, I've been listening to a lot of Joe Rogan podcasts recently. <laughs> well, there yeah, was another. Like in your sorry, apartment. Sorry, mate. <laughs> I said you had a lot of time when you were stuck in your apartment. Y yes. Well, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of time. Um, but j j j just recently as well. But, um, you know, the most intelligent people, um, the ones that the generally more studied and more learned, especially in universities, are sometimes more reluctant to believe another conclusion because they've been so indoctrinated into believe one system that is from trusted, you know, the academic system that they're reluctant to change because, you know, science does change, but it, it could be 30 years before it, you know, it's it's collectively accepted. But I think with the, the case of protein, I think people, there's been so many rumors, innuendos, and people just in the fit, the non-fitness world, in the outside the fitness world, they just have this weird, like, protein is evil type of thing, or too much, too much of anything is bad. And they, they don't look into it because they're not part of the fitness community. They may be part of another community, but all of us know in the fitness community, it's not only not harmful, it's necessity for maintaining good muscle and losing fat. And there's just so much benefit out there. Yeah, I tell people all the time, if if aliens came down to Earth and they said, you know what, we're going to fatten up all these humans because we're going to eat them, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the worst way to fatten us humans is to give us a lot of protein. I, I'd be giving humans like donuts and carbs and fat and carbs and fat, and that would be a good way to fatten them up. But if you think you're going to get fat, drinking whey protein or casein protein or whatever it ain't gonna happen it's gonna be really difficult That's not the way to get fat. Yeah, so we've tried it it doesn't work very well <laughs> well we all should be vegans then that that, that may help the the aliens 
Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, off that, guys, um, it's, it, if Joey and I could uh, talk for hours about this and we'll have to have a pina colada together next time in America, uh, in Florida, while, while we're paddle boarding. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Christine, oh, we'll start on my screen. We'll start from the top. And I hope you guys have prepared some questions for Dr. Jose. Um, this this is hey, your moment moment of glory. Drew, can you change it so that I can see everyone? I can I can't see everyone on the screen. I don't know I don't know how to work this. <laughs> so I'm like I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can you see now? Yep, I can see everyone. I okay, see I, I got myself off the spotlight. Um, I see Austin's so going. Alan is hiding, and Kathy's hiding. Yes. So, um, ladies first, and and also uh, Filipino ladies first. Um, <laughs> would you would you like to ask your questions? Questions already. Oh, okay. Um, maybe Drew later about the questions. <laughs> um, after <laughs> give me some. A few okay. Minutes to, because yeah. we just to FYI, guys, please ask as many questions. But we're going to do a hard stop um, in approximately twenty minutes from now. So please have your, your questions ready and um, yeah, um, fire away. So how about we go on Andreas then as next? Yes, please. <laughs> so thanks very much for being with us, uh, Dr. Jose, today. And uh, I was very much looking forward to this. I've read a lot of your research and uh, it's a subject that has been close to my heart for a very long time. I'm, uh, I'm I've been interested in this since I was a child. So it's a great uh, opportunity to get your insights on this. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, should I ask them in sequence? Uh, how, 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 how should I do it? Yeah, go ahead and ask them in sequence and I'll, I'll try to address them. Thank you. All right. So uh, the first uh, question is regarding free form amino acids. It's a really interesting thing to me that uh, the first thing, uh, free form amino acids, even in large quantities, are quoted on a lot of products as having no calorie content. That's always been quite fascinating to me because obviously that's not how it works inside the body. If you're taking 20 grams of free form amino acids, something is certainly going to have a calorific content. Right. So I would like your opinion on that. And then the second thing is, I mean, it's generally known that a lot of proteins which are spiked artificially with free form amino acids interfere with absorption. Uh, in general, of the uh, amino acid content of, let's say, a whey protein, if you're spiking the whey protein of a poor quality with some free form amino acids to make its amino acid profile look better, something different is happening than a natural whey protein. So that also comes up with, um, you know, taking amino acid supplements in conjunction. So if you were to take an amino acid supplement, uh, even if it's branch chain amino acids, let's say 15 minutes before a whey protein drink, something different would happen with absorption. Uh, certainly something different happens with the absorption mechanisms inside the digestive system. So wh what's your opinion on that? And what's the correct practice? Uh, well, no, those are interesting questions. Um, the first one dealing with, um, you know, absorption issues. But let me let me sort of backtrack a little. One of my good friends, he's at the University of Arkansas Medical Center, Arnie Ferrando. He does a lot of work on essential amino acids. And we, we do know this. Gram for gram, if you get the essential amino acids and compare it the same amount to whole protein. So let's say you get 10 grams of essentials versus 10 grams of whole protein. Essential amino acids do promote a much greater increase in muscle protein synthesis. So they actually work better, gram for gram. So the question is, well, why why do people not consume essentials? And it's usually a flavor issue. People would still rather consume whole protein because it tastes better than essential amino acids. Now, whether the essential amino acids, if you consume it pre before whole protein, you had mentioned branch chains, which are three of the essentials, whether it impacts digestion or absorption. I'm not aware of any data to show that it's because it would be no different than consuming a whole protein one type of whole protein, then consuming another one later on. Uh, I think your digestive tract has no issues in terms of absorption. Now, um, the cal what's funny about the calorie issue, it's, it's interesting, you bring up the calorie issue, and I think each country treats this differently in terms of, okay, what's the calorie content? Are you dealing just with whole protein? Which I think agencies in the United States tend to do. It's like, okay, what are the whole proteins versus if I just add branch chains, which actually there is a 
calorie issue to that, but it's really more of a legal question, not a scientific one. And that's why it is a little deceptive in terms of not counting the calories from essential amino acids. But it, it, in pragmatic terms, it may not matter because one, the calories itself isn't enough to, <clears throat> to really matter. And also the calories from essential amino acids or branch chain amino acids certainly are not gonna affect um, body composition negatively. So, um, but those are interesting questions. I think the bottom line, this is how I would look at it pragmatically or practically. Essential amino acids do work better than whole protein when you compare it gram for gram, but consumers still choose whole protein over essential amino acids, mainly because if it's a flavor issue. And, uh, and oddly enough, I remember way back when I helped a company make an essential amino acid formula. This is, was for uh, Champion Nutrition. This was like 20 years ago, I think. And people wouldn't buy it. It was just simply, it was flavor. And they're like, you know what? I just don't like the taste. And Actually, personally, I don't like the taste either. I'll be quite honest with you. I'd rather consume 20 grams of whey protein than 10 grams of essential amino acids, even though gram for gram essential amino acids work better. So that sort of answered your question. You, you have, you have indeed. In continuation to that, um, okay, two things. So in my research, I've, I've done some uh, research for my master's. I did a systematic review for my master's uh, degree, and that looked at a large part of it. I won't go into detail to you know um, waste your time because there's obviously a lot of other questions. But basically, uh, the calorie content because of diet-induced thermogenesis is generally accepted, I think, to be around 3.6 grams, kilocalories per gram of protein because of the diet-induced thermogenesis effect. D do you think there should be a review of the calorific content because of that in, uh, you know, science generally? Yeah, well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but you're right, because of the thermic effect, because of the high thermic effect. Um, but then you're dealing with really uh, uh, sort of the net cost of consuming a protein or amino acid. We know the thermic effect's much higher, so should we adjust that based on the thermic effect? And um, you would have to, here's the problem with that. You would have to make adjustments for different kinds of proteins, I would guess. Um, that whey might be better than, maybe different than casein, which might be different than soy, which might be different than, than in uh, the same amount of um, uh, free form amino acids. And, and I don't know if that would be, help consumers or become more confusing. I think for scientists, you know, for people who are studying it like yourself, it, it makes sense. But for the consumer, it might be, it might actually be more confusing because you know, they would say, wait a minute, I thought protein, protein is four calories per gram and carbs are four calories per gram. But, but when I eat protein versus carbs, I put body fat on easier with carbs. But wait a minute, it's the same calories. And I think, the, I think it would confuse a lot of people. I mean, for us who study it, we're like, okay, that makes sense. But for people who don't study it, they're like, well, wait, I thought it was the same amount of calories, which technically it is if it's in a bomb calorimeter, but not in a human body. <laughs> so. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and then one final thing, uh, forgive me for asking so many. So it's about the timing of protein. From what I've seen, it seems to me that, uh, you know, splitting the intake of protein over several meals does affect muscle protein synthesis in a very different way than consuming, let's say, two meals, two large meals of, uh, of you know, I don't know, 100 grams of protein, let's say. I mean, for me, it's settled that there's only... Uh, you know, that it makes a lot of sense to take, let's say, 30 grams several times a day than 100 grams twice a day. And yet there is a lot of discussion that it's the total amount over a day that matters more than splitting it. Wow, you, uh, <laughs> that's a great question because that's something we argue about all the time, <laughs> literally all the time. Um, <laughs> I, I also say it's total protein that matters. However, there is a huge caveat, which you brought up. I say total protein matters. And someone says, well, why don't I just eat all my protein like at breakfast or dinner? I said, well, you could do that, but I don't think it'd be very smart. <laughs> There's no way you can eat, you know, 200 grams of protein. Well, maybe you could, 200 grams of protein in a city. So from a pragmatic standpoint, there is a timing issue. And I think what people have conflated is there's a timing issue with spreading your meals out, let's say every three or four hours. And then people said, well, then do I need to consume protein after I work out? And my answer to that is, 
yes, you should, because there's no advantage to not consuming protein after you work out. So because we work on a 24 hour window and we're only, you know, let's say we're asleep eight hours. So the rest of the time we're awake for 16 hours. It is best to spread your meals. And the data, I think, says basically, let's say every three or four hours, you get a bolus of 30 grams of protein every three or four hours. It elevates muscle protein synthesis and then it drops and goes up and, and drops. That seems to be the ideal way of promoting gains in lean body mass or gains in muscle mass. So it's people that it's funny. People say, well, timing doesn't matter. It's just total protein intake. But because we live on a clock, you can't really separate them. I mean, because no one's going to eat all their protein. Let's say it's two meals a day, breakfast and dinner. That's still not ideal because you have this entire seven or eight hour span where you haven't consumed any food. So, you know, Andreas, you're right. It's, it's best to spread it out. Um, I, but again, this is primarily for people interested in increasing lean body mass. Some people, because of, of their work schedule and whatnot, they can't really eat that frequently. So in that case, I say, hey, just try the traditional breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's still better than eating once a day or twice a day. But those are great questions. It's funny. We, we argue about this all the time in my sports nutrition class. You know, students are like, why don't I just eat all of it at once? I'm like, well, I guess you could, but I don't think that would work well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Jose. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. I'll take the next question. Thank, thank you, Andreas. OK, uh, well, if Christine's ready, because um, I did say ladies first, if not, we'll jump ahead. Christine, do you have your question available? Uh, ready? Oh. Uh, hi, Dr. Antonio. Nice to uh, meet you. Finally. I didn't know you were Filipino <laughs> and um, and uh, no. feel proud about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're, you're, you're a teacher in this. Um, my uh, question, actually, uh, Andreas actually asked about it already, about the timing, because there was some confusion about um, total protein versus uh, three or four hours uh, post-exercise. Uh, okay. Um, my question is actually uh, just two. Uh, the first one is in the ingestion of uh, BCAAs and um, whey protein. So I don't really work with athletes yet, but I work with uh, people who want to be fit. So that's the reason why I took a sports nutrition. I am a, a community nutrition graduate, and I just want to elevate my knowledge to be at par um, and updated to the latest research. So a lot of people going to in the, in the gym ask me, so is taking BCAAs plus whey protein ideal? Because they don't really know. I mean, I don't. Um, I don't really. I don't know if uh, they know the timing. You know, because uh, they both have the same <laughs> elements. Yeah. Well, if you're working with general population, so you're not working with elite athletes, right? These are just people who. Okay. In general, they should stick to whole protein. In fact, um, I think in that case, branched chain amino acids are a waste of time. The the only instance where branched chain amino acids would be helpful is if you're an athlete uh, competing in a sport and the value of branched chain amino acids is it's basically to decrease delayed onset muscle soreness. But if you're just training for general fitness, uh, it, you don't need the branched chain amino acids. I mean, you could put it this way, you could take it, it's not gonna hurt you, but you're better off consuming whole protein, particularly the milk-based proteins. If you can't do the milk-based proteins, I mean, there are good vegan alternatives out there, but in general, the data shows that the milk-based proteins are, are the single best proteins you can consume. Yeah. Uh, but about um, some people in the gym, of course, they're more athletic than others, but I can't say that they're really like compete. Um, some are uh, com uh, competing, but they want to know um, the timing of ingesting BCAAs in a way. Some are not really... Um, informed and of course creatine well well the timing isn't really an issue for most people in the general population in fact i would as a as, as a matter of practical advice i would tell people make sure you consume protein post-workout because it's convenient you need to rehydrate yourself um the branch chains i don't think matter if you're not if you're not competitive you'll the branch chains are only important if if the goal is to decrease uh muscle soreness um so that's that's that. Now you had another question, which I just forgot. I was about to answer, and then I forgot what your question was. 
Sorry. Yeah, the timing. So um, oh, the they take uh, most of most of them do this. They take the three and they ask me how to how do you take all of these? Plus they have collagen. So these are the supplements that they uh, they have in their uh, portfolio that I don't know how to answer. How? When? Well, yeah. cre you had mentioned creatine, right? Okay. There's no timing issue with creatine. As long as they take three to five grams a day, they're good. So that's good. I've been taking creatine now for 30 years, about three grams a day. So that aside, creatine's easy. Just take it whenever it's convenient. The protein or branched chain amino acids, technically there's not a timing issue, meaning you have to take it at a certain time. However, with protein, we'll leave branched chains out for now, but with protein, I think from a convenient standpoint, it's important that they take it after they train because then it's a behavior that gets self-reinforced. You work out, you get your protein shake. Um, otherwise, if you tell them to take it at a time that isn't related to training, they may not stick with it. So the simplest, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in simple and pragmatic advice. Take something after you work out because then both behaviors are intertwined and it, you're more apt to adhere to the behavior. I'd, I'd like to add Thanks, on that. I, um, I totally agree. The little thing I do, I mean, when I was younger, 20, 20 years ago, um, because I read it in Muscle and Fitness magazine, the my, my own um, research um, articles, because it wasn't the internet back then, um, you know, I was doing the loading phase um, with, with a sugary drink, Gatorade or grapefruit juice or something like this. And uh, it was very troublesome. And uh, because I was having so much creatine um, as well, um, I would be urinating during the night because uh, it was just way too much. So I I don't do it that way. I know that was the old science and science evolves as, as Dr. Jose has Antonio has said many times. <laughs> what I do, because I do use creatine um, and I've, I've been using it for 20 years, um, I add it in my protein, like literally in my protein, I add uh, yeah, about five grams of creatine, I add uh, five to 10 grams of glutamine, and I add about 3000 milligrams of vitamin C powder. Um, and that's my post-workout shake. So I have everything in there and it's very convenient. And I also might add, I don't, I actually don't take it even every day. I just take it after my post-workout uh, weightlifting days. And, and that's more than enough for me. And it's very convenient. Yeah, that's, yeah. When you, when you tie those behaviors together, you take it after you work out, then it becomes, then it becomes natural. You don't even think about it. Like when I, when I train, I immediately, once I'm done, I immediately just get a shake and it's just convenient. I sit on my patio, I drink my shake, I stare at the water and I'm good to go. <laughs> keep, keep it the, the kiss simple uh, principle. Exactly, Drew. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Th thank you, Christine. Do you have any other questions? Uh, is that a, 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 a it uh, faded out? Was that a no or yes? Your volume's uh, cut. You, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I'll raise my hand later once I formulate the next question. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. No problem. Okay. Um, we've got Alan. Do you have a question, Alan? Or questions? Hi. Hi. Um, actually, I have. Two, but those are actually answered in uh, uh, Andreas and also Christine's question. So uh, I initially had a question on the uh, timing of protein intake because recently I've been in the discussion with my friends on uh, he was interested in intermittent fasting uh, to be uh, in, in summary. So he was talking about trying to optimize his protein intake in two meals or one meal per day rather than, uh, I, I'm thinking like five meals per day. So we are having a very heated discussion on, on uh, what matters and, and how much should he take. So basically it devolved into, uh, uh, I was going into going uh, eating whole foods, getting your, our protein intake through whole foods through three or five meals per day. And then my friend was actually going into uh, taking supplement, uh, protein supplements because he couldn't, I mean, he physically couldn't eat that much of protein in a day with his physical requirements. So uh, just now Andrea's question actually, I mean, uh, Dr. Jose's answer to Andrea's question actually cleared up some uh, uh, questions that I had. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, you definitely want to spread your meals throughout the day. Eating one or yeah. two meals 
yeah, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. definitely get the, you know, to me, three would be minimum, a minimum of three meals. And then five would be probably ideal. But yeah, yeah, some people can't do that for whatever reason. But yeah, it's it's better to spread it out throughout the day. Yeah, I do it to five because even with three, yeah, the, the, that's too, totally too much meat for me to ingest in one point. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't. <laughs> Yeah, but that, but that, 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 that was the question that I had, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. No, I was going to say, I treat every time you eat as a meal. So, for instance, um, when people say, do I, when I have a shake, is that a meal? I'm like, yeah, treat that as a meal. A lot of people think of a meal as you have to sit down, eat, get carbs, fat, and protein, or whatnot. When, in fact, anytime you consume anything, whether it's a protein bar, a protein shake, or a snack, I call that a meal. So, technically... Mm -hmm. Five meals shouldn't be that hard because maybe two of those are like small snacks and the other three might be larger. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thank Alan. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Drew, Thanks, you're Alan. Up. There you go. And um, Alston, would you like to ask some questions? Alston is... Uh, Noah Stuck, he. Alston's there, but I'm not sure. He's, he may be not. Andreas has got another question. Um, and Christine's got two questions. Okay. Um, Andreas, go ahead. Uh, thanks for, I'm really happy to get a chance to ask one more thing. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jose, I'd like to hear your opinion and your thoughts on uh, the subject of muscle protein synthesis versus uh, preventing muscle breakdown. So, for instance, we know that leucine is much better at inducing uh, muscle protein synthesis uh, compared to something like HMB, which prevents breakdown. And both of these are important in different ways, especially when you talk about the timing like we have. You know, most of the time you're kind of trying to prevent catabolism, but then anabolism in the post-exercise period becomes much more important. So something like leucine would, might, might be more important. What do you think about that? What should we focus on? How should we think about it? Well, I tend, rather than thinking of it, of it as just synthesis versus degradation or anabolism versus catabolism, in general, you are, you're either in positive or negative muscle protein balance, right? And when you eat a meal, you're in positive balance. When you're, when you're fasting or starving, you're in negative balance. The issue, it's funny, you bring up the issue of so much data focuses on muscle protein synthesis and not so much on muscle protein degradation or, or protein catabolism. And, and honestly, the primary issue with that is it's easier to measure synthesis. <laughs> That's why you have all these labs that measure synthesis, but not many focus on degradation, which obviously if degradation goes down and synthesis goes up, the net, net effect is you get muscle anabolism. But it's, it's interesting you bring up HMB. I think that's one of the, one of the key reasons you use HMB because of its anti-catabolic effect. Uh, but in general, I view, you know, when I look at uh, data, whether it's on foods or supplements or whatnot, to me, I always I don't necessarily focus on synthesis per se. I focus on the net effect. And here's the thing, and this is the problem with a lot of the acute studies, which you probably read. If you look at something acutely, and let's say synthesis goes up or degradation goes down, I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting. But what matters over the course of four, eight, or 12 weeks? What's the net effect? And that's really all that matters, whether the net effect is from higher catabolism, uh, less catabolism, or more anabolism. To me, that's more of a scientific question rather than a pragmatic one. So that's why I'm a big fan of when people start doing studies that are four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, or longer, because those are very hard to do. That is, to me, is much more important than the myriad of studies that focus on an acute, you know, you get an acute bolus of HMB or an acute bolus of protein, and the synthesis goes up or degradation goes down. It's like, okay, well, acutely, that's kind of interesting, but what matters is what happens weeks or months down the road. So, but it's a great point you bring up that so much is focused on synthesis and not so much on catabolism or degradation. You should go to school you, I'm working on your master's degree. No, I finished. I finished my master's degree, but I'm, with, I'm an avid researcher. 
and you... I think about these things every day. So I read all the time. It's it, it's my life's you... work. It's you should pursue a PhD. <laughs> Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Thank you, <laughs> Doctor Jose. Mm -hmm. Christine has a question. Thank you, Andreas. Christine. Yes. Yes, my question is, um, I'm also working with uh, people who is a plant being a, having a plant-based uh, diet or even going vegan is big here. And um, I'm working with an athlete, they tell them have more protein. So we give them options. We have, the, you said in your paper that 20 to 40 uh, grams of bolus protein whey um, is ideal, but is that that's for... Uh, animal type yeah so how would we uh how much can we uh prescribe for like soy or a pea type of a blend yeah it, it's a great question if you're vegan or vegetarian and you don't want to consume milk-based protein shakes you could still get the essential amino <clears throat> excuse me the essential amino acids you just got to increase the dose so let's say like for instance i usually consume 20 to 30 grams of whey protein post-workout. Let's say I wanted a vegan protein. I would just increase the dose a little bit. So instead of 20 to 30 grams, I would consume 30 to 40 grams of a plant-based protein. So you can make up for the lower quality by increasing the quantity. Um, and that's the best way to do it. I mean, if they don't want the milk-based protein, they're just gonna have to consume more of the plant-based stuff. So you're saying it's around like a hundred 50%, uh, sorry, uh, like that, uh, like add around the additional 50%. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that would be a problem for uh, aging, uh, the aging population who are also, they would need more protein. That's true. More. Yeah. And that's why it's, it's really hard to get these, be, uh, to get people to comply with these behaviors. I mean, let's face it, a lot of it is learning the psychology of why people do things or not do things. But at the end of the day, they have to do it. Otherwise, you know, you lose lean body mass with age, you know, sarcopenia, you become less fit with age. You just you just got to do these behaviors. I mean, because there's really no other choice. Um, another question that I have, I think I, I read somewhere is that um, re, um, ingesting protein alone versus uh, ingesting protein with carbohydrates, there is a higher absorption rate of uh, Protein is that correct? I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter if there's a mix with like fat, anything. Yeah, that's that's not correct. Um, you could mix. Uh, it with yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you for doing that. Thanks, Christine. Drew. Thank, thank you, Christine. Yeah, I'd just like to add one point, and um, we've we've actually discussed this on email, you and I, uh, Dr. Jose. Uh, in in regards to the vegan the vegan proteins and the the, the two issues in one you've you've um, very uh, you've accurately pointed out in regards to increasing the dose and the reason you're increasing the dose is two reasons one is the bioavailability to some degree depending on what protein but also the amino acid profile that that they are lacking in certain ones so another way of doing it is 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 uh, very carefully and and most vegans or most consumers are not going to be very carefully choosing what is the combination of those plant derived proteins to equal that similar to that of dairy and that that is very complicated um you know that being said we are bringing out a new protein here's my little plug uh from nitec that is equaling um the amino acid profile actually the ds um the digest digestible um index amino acid score to equal actually um, with some research done in a, a very famous Florida University, hopefully sometime next year, we will also prove that um, that that our combination um, and formula next protein um, is is adequate to that of dairy and, and also tastes like dairy. But it's complicated because most consumers are not going to do that. So by putting it into a single formula and backing it with research, not just marketing, I think that's very important. But consumers can do it, but they really have to understand the science and understand the amino acids and also um, choosing a good quality plant-based protein because they're not all equal. Some of them 
um, just they don't digest well. Um, they're, they're, they're very harsh on the stomach. Um, and uh, there is some um, allergen um, aspects as well. So it is complicated, but it can be done. Um, so I, I just like to add that. Good point. Good, I, yeah. Um, Alston, I don't think is on. Do we have any other final questions? Can I, can I ask something if, if possible? I don't know how the time is. We'll take one uh, more question about that. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jose. So my, I'll, I'll ask a question in kind of the opposite direction. Now, we know from uh, research that we've seen in the last decade mostly that uh, cellular autophagy or DNA renewal is extremely important for disease prevention and uh, some ca cancer uh, prevention more specifically. So when we're focusing on kind of, you know, maximizing muscle protein synthesis uh, and, uh, you know, minimizing breakdown and all of these things, we're kind of uh, forgetting the autophagy or the renewal, the cellular renewal mechanisms. What, what do you think about that? Wait, Reed, I, I missed the first part of your question. So uh, a lot of research that I've seen in the last decade mostly uh, is indicating that cellular autophagy or the removal of kind of old DNA, the cycle, is extremely mm -hmm. important. So if we're mo focusing a lot on muscle protein synthesis and anti-catabolism, how do we factor in the autophagy benefits into the formula and how should that be dealt with? That's a good question. The, the, the quick answer to that is I'm not sure. However, I think with all of these things, there's a trade-off. Because I've heard the arguments about autophagy and how the signals from, from exercise, i.e. the MPS signals, um, people said, well, wouldn't that also promote tumor formation or cancer formation um, because it's anabolic? But here's the trade-off. So people who exercise and consume, let's say, protein because they're promoting gains in lean body mass, there's a health benefit to that that would outweigh anything related to, you know, um, the effects on like mTOR and whatnot. People are like, well, well, if mTOR goes up, does that promote tumor for formation? Well, mTOR goes up also to promote muscle protein synthesis. So the, what's the trade-off? The trade-off is you're much healthier because of exercise. You have more lean body mass because of exercise and nutrition. And we do know that lean body, people who exercise live longer. And also that lean body mass, the more you have it, let's say you end up in a hospital, the, the better chance you have of having a good outcome if you're in the hospital. And that's why I think this focus on autophagy or autophagy, however people pronounce it, I think is, is you're sort of missing the forest for the trees when in fact the exercise signal outweighs any of that. Uh, well, the exercise plus nutrition signal. And I think that's much more important. But that's, a, it's, that's an interesting question because it's actually a complicated question. You know, people think most synthesis, 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 and it's like, well, Tumors, you know, undergo protein synthesis as well, which is true, but it's the exercise signal that is paramount. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that whole thing. Absolutely. It was amazing. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Andreas. I appreciate that. Uh, Andreas always has um, amazing questions. He's a, a learned fellow. He's actually a lawyer as well, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah, he's... Very oh, gifted good. young, very gifted young man. <laughs> good. Well, Dr. Jose Anto, I know you've got an appointment. You've got some research uh, in the lab today, so we don't want to hold you up. And it's always a pleasure. And we absolutely love, um, um, I hope all the students appreciated you um, on here. I certainly do. And I love our banter and talks and look forward to doing it in person uh, later this year. I will mention this, if, if any of you need to reach me, because I appreciate you spending time, because we're all in weird time zones. It's early morning for me. I think it's late night for you, Drew. I don't even know. Um, but you can reach me via email. My my academic email is jose.antonio. So it's my name, jose.antonio at nova, N-O-V-A, N-O-V-A dot E-D-U. So jose.antonio at nova.edu. You can find me on the Nova website as well if you want to look there, but that's my academic email. If you have any questions, I'm Andreas, you came up with some great ones, Christine as well. Just send me an email. And also Drew knows how to reach me as well. If you kind of forget all this stuff, just ask Drew. Uh, absolutely. And I, I got to say Thank one you so thing. Much. 
He's very good at communication. I don't know how you do it, mate. You're very, um, very humble and very good at communication on email. So guys, reach out. And also a reminder, um, there's a webinar, an ISSN webinar uh, coming up. When is it, Dr. Jose? It's a... It's October 14th, yes. October 14th. I, <laughs> I, I, I forgot. <laughs> but go to ISSN.net, that website, and you'll see the online webinar, ISSN.net. So, yeah. <laughs> the online webinar. And if yeah. you guys are all interested, uh, Dr. Jose Antonio, because we're partners, has put together a very special discount. So for GPNI um, students, uh, so you get 10% off if you're interested. We've posted that on the website or reach out to me or Kathy or one of the team members and you can use that coupon code to get 10% off. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's different time zones, but um, I think it's like, is it early morning or evening? So it may fit on with, in with people. Well, it's early morning here. So no, so the, the, web it, the webinar is actually, so we're talking about New York City time, Miami time. It's, yep. it's from 12 o'clock noon till 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So God, that would be a weird time for you. <laughs> so, yeah, it would be. Yeah. But fortunately, it's going to be recorded and available as well to playback. So, you know, you guys can watch it that way. But I implore you to watch the live version because it's so much more interesting and, and you get to, you know, maybe ask some questions and things like that. So please reach out. And next year, there's going to be the, obviously the conference coming up and um, I'll be absolutely there. Um and no, no holes barred. And uh, I, I encourage all of you to also attend because not only you'll learn science, but you'll get to rub shoulders with some of the elite people and drink cocktails, which is always fun in board shorts. And uh, right. and we say thongs in Australia, but that's the wrong terminology for Americans. Yeah, you're not wearing thongs here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Flip flops. <laughs> all right, buddy. Well, uh, I enjoyed this. You guys have a great day or evening and uh looking forward to the next one we do drew thank you so much thanks guys thank you dr jose thank you so much have a great thank weekend you. guys bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.